he lost control of his truck, swerved over my lane. The nine wheels of the truck rolled over my car. Don Piper died instantly. They did all the tests they had at their disposal and determined that I was uh, deceased. But in reality, his new life was just beginning. I was driving along a highway one moment, and the very next moment, a fraction of a fraction of a second, I'm actually standing at the gates of heaven. 90 minutes later, a passerby witnesses his miraculous return to life. I think his actual words were, the dead man is singing. Well, that's not something that, you know, you you would typically hear and so well you just think you know it's air escaping from the lungs you know we've checked in we've run all the tests you know the, you know we're medical professionals we know a dead body today on life focus the man who went to heaven and back heaven is a buffet for the senses it is a sensory explosion uh, all the sights that we we have here that we see if I'm standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon and I'm looking at the sunset and I'm thinking this is just awesome heaven is a million times more beautiful than that in the late 1980s Don Piper a busy pastor and father of three might have been cynical when people describe their experiences after being declared clinically dead but he never doubted the reality of heaven I knew it was breathtakingly beautiful I knew that it was eternal. I just didn't see how a person could really die and go to heaven and come back and talk about it. But all that changed one rainy day in 1989. It was here at the Veterans of Foreign Wars Memorial Bridge, north of Houston, that Don Piper died. People need to know that heaven is real, and I had a chance to see that. His chance came after attending a pastor's convention at Trinity Pines Conference Center several hours north of Houston. The journey began with a small but fateful decision. That day I paused at the gate and, uh, and really just decided to go a different route. Don's new route headed south on Texas Highway 19. It was raining, cold, uh, the windshield wipers are going. At 11.45 a.m., he approached the long and narrow Memorial Bridge. And I couldn't see beyond the end of the bridge. I had a 110 mile an hour impact with a big truck. I never saw the truck. There was no reaction time. The two vehicles collided head on. I was driving along a highway one moment and the very next moment, a fraction of a fraction of a second, I'm actually standing at the gates of heaven. Don cannot recall the 90 minutes on earth but vividly remembers his experience in a more glorious place. The brilliance of the light, the magnificence of the light, is, uh, is beyond anything I've ever gazed upon here on Earth. It is almost as if everything is alive. It, it just glistens. Several other vehicles were involved in the accident. The truck rolled over the top of Don's Ford Escort, crushing his body. My internal organs had really been crushed. The roof of the car collapsed on my head, and I had, um, had been bleeding from the ears and the eyes and the mouth and nose, which were all brain damage signs. The arm was basically in the back seat. I mean, those were very apparent injuries. The dash came across both of my legs, just kind of like a guillotine. A guillotine that crushed his right leg and nearly severed his left leg above the knee four inches of the femur, the largest bone in the human body, was ejected from the car, apparently out the window into the lake because it was never located. His left arm was also nearly severed and missing several inches of bone. Eventually four ambulances arrived. They ran EKGs. They did all the tests they had at their disposal and determined that I was uh, deceased. A policeman got a waterproof tarp out of his squad car, came over to my vehicle so no one would have to see what I looked like in the car. It was quite uh, awful to look at. The news of the accident reached Don's wife, Eva, but she was not told the accident was fatal. There's been a wreck, um, and Don's been hurt. That's all they knew at that point in time. Uh, and, and the thing I remember most 
about that is just a very real sense of peace just covered me from my head to my toes. And I knew he was going to be okay. But medical personnel at the scene believed differently. They actually phoned for the county official, the Justice of the Peace, to come to the scene to sign documents which would allow the body to be transported to a uh, mortuary. Until this man came to the scene. And I was a stranger to him. The late Dick Honorecker, seen here in a previously recorded interview, was also on his way home from the pastor's conference and stopped to help. Very candidly, I, it was as though I was compelled uh, to stop and to pray for him. The Lord just impressed on me uh, very emphatically, very urgently, that I was to pray for him. So Dick approached one of the officers and said, uh, is there anyone here I can pray for? And he was told uh, no, because the two people in the other two cars had actually been transported. And I, of course, was deceased. So they said, quite honestly, there is no one to pray for. But Dick insisted. And I laid my hands on him and began to pray for him, that there be no internal injuries and there be no head injuries. At 1.15 p.m., a full 90 minutes after Don Piper had been declared dead, the unbelievable happened. And I'm hearing a voice behind me. And that voice is the voice of Dick Honorecker. I began to sing, and all of a sudden, I heard him singing with me. Hearing his own voice singing jarred this survivor back to earth. I was in utter brilliance in heaven. Now I'm in the dark, and I'm thinking, why is it dark? His next sensation? Excruciating pain. It was about to get as sorrowful and dreadful and painful is what I had just experienced was glorious and majestic. Every time my heart would beat, it would be like hitting my limbs with a hammer. Turned away from two local hospitals, Don felt every bump and shake during the nightmarish ride to Houston. It was just the most excruciating, powerful, throbbing pain that I had ever, I didn't even know you could feel pain like that. Don finally arrived at Memorial Hermann Hospital's trauma center. My internal organs were intact. Doctors determined Don amazingly did not have any brain damage or head injuries. And even though my other injuries are cataclysmic, those two life-threatening experiences are no longer in existence. They have been prayed away by a man on a bridge under a tarp. When I saw him in the emergency room, he was being evaluated by numerous other doctors uh, in addition to me. It soon became evident to Dr. Thomas Greider, an orthopedic surgeon, if they didn't take drastic measures immediately, Don may not survive. We had to find a way to either take off the leg or there was a new device that had not been used very often to save the leg. The experimental device, called an Elizarov frame, had rarely been used in the United States. Because we have to put it into the leg through the muscles uh, is extremely painful. Uh, and that's why it's only used with a great deal of reluctance. Metal wires and rods force the bone to grow while keeping the surrounding tissue intact. Uh, the problem with that would be it could conceivably break or fail uh, before the bone heals. Amputation would be less painful. He would only need probably one operation, then he'd be done with it, and then, then we could fit him with a prosthesis to let him get out of bed and start moving. Eva made the difficult decision to try the Elizarov frame. There was no guarantee that it would work, but at least Don would have his leg. If you can imagine taking an ice pick and just kind of burying it into your leg to the bone, and then moving around it, I had 30 of those on my left leg, and I had 12 of them on my left arms. There are many times while Don was recovering that he was angry with me for, for giving that permission because it was just excruciatingly painful. I never went to sleep uh, for a year. I just, uh, I fought it, and I, I strained, and then I would find myself unconscious. I just passed out. Ultimately, Don endured 34 painful surgeries. I wanted to go to heaven on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. I, I never wanted to come back from heaven. I still would prefer to be there than here. His yearning turned into heavy depression. That was my scariest time. That was when, I guess, my faith did waver a little bit because Don wasn't trying 
and that's so unlike him. He's so determined, and he had quit. It was a dark period, a very, very dark period. Two things really seemed to overwhelm me, uh, a sense of what I saw and lost and a sense of what I might ever do that mattered. It was just too much for him, and I'd, I'd, I'd fuss at him, I'd conjole, I'd, I'd plead, I'd whatever, and, and he didn't want it. He would just literally turn his head. He wouldn't talk to me. Um, and that was rough. That was very hard. And uh, people were nice, and they were thoughtful, but no one would ever make the statement, you're going to be fine, you're going to walk again. For a year and a half, Don kept his heavenly experience to himself. I didn't want to share it. I felt uh, like it was a sacred secret. My advice to him was, you're going to have to be comfortable with sharing this experience. I would suggest you pick a couple people that you, that you know, uh, that you trust. Reluctantly, Don trusted in David Gentiles, his best friend for over 30 years. I guess he was just kind of seeing if I would laugh at him or say he was crazy or whatever. A small part of it probably had to do with the fact that uh, I felt if I shared it, people would think that I just had lost it. Don slowly revealed more details of what he witnessed during the 90 minutes his body lay lifeless. I heard angels more than saw them. And what I could hear was the beating of their wings. And so it was just an awesome presence of the angels, and they're everywhere. In heaven, you can hear thousands of glorious songs. You hear them all at the same time, and there is no chaos. Frankly, to have someone I knew sitting across from me saying, well, and I saw this, and it looked this color, and this was the sound, it was a little freaky. Don cannot forget the moment he reached heaven's gate. There was a parting of the crowd and the revealing, you know, the street. And so I began to move forward. Uh, and it was becoming obvious that it's time for me now, having been welcomed, to enter. I'm not sure we walked. I know that sounds very strange. Let's just say we moved. They moved toward the gate on what Don says appeared to be a street of gold. The closer you get to the gate, the brighter it gets, and inside the gate is, uh, is an utter brilliance. I was in the presence of God, and I would never have to suffer pain again. I would never have to be weary again. I would never have to worry again. But as Don crossed the threshold, he paused. That pause was, um, was, was my moment to return. Uh, the culmination of all those prayers on earth was, was realized at that moment. As God, um, in his infinite wisdom, decided it was not my time and sent me back. Until Don shared his experience, Eva was hurt that Don wished he had not survived the accident. I was not real happy with him. And so when he, you know, when I heard about the heaven experience, it was like, oh, now I get it. Because if you've been there, why would you want to be back here? My experience in heaven was the most real experience of my existence. I had an eyewitness account from someone uh, who was very credible to me and trustworthy. And, and so th there was a... Um, there was a legitimacy. I know he's not prone to flights of fancy. He's a very logical, think-it-through person. Has always been that way. So when he talks about things that he experienced in heaven, I know that they're real. As real as heaven is to Don, others who have died and returned describe another place, one that is dark and dreadful. And they'll say, uh, there were screams, there were flames, and there was sulfur. It was an agonizing, horrifying, stupefying place. And it's, uh, it's really, you could see it on their face. And then inevitably, they will say, the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you, when you share, to let people know hell is real, too. It was like being in a nightmare and trying to scream. And as hard as you tried to scream, you, you couldn't get the word, you couldn't get the sound out. And it wasn't a nightmare. It was reality. It was my reality. And I can only say that it was hell. Several years ago, Sharon Maddox underwent surgery. Under anesthesia, 
she became aware of herself slipping away to a dark, black place. The darkness was thick. It was, it was a total enveloping darkness. It, 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 was, it was so dark, you wouldn't have been able to see the hand in front of your face, is the way I describe it. I experienced gut-wrenching, excruciating pain. It was so unbearable. It, I, I can't even, I don't even have the words to describe how it felt. There's also an urgency about um, life and death. You know, when you've had a big truck hit you uh, when you're only 38 years old and your life ends and then you've been given it back, but it's a different life. You're mindful of the fact that this, we're very fragile. Spending time with his family is more of a priority now. The way to describe that, yeah. What do you think about yeah. it now? He was always a good family man, but I think he takes more time and more pleasure out of enjoying his family and making sure that we really do spend time together. You know what? It made me feel right at home because I was home. Heaven is home. Today, Don travels worldwide to share his story with an eager audience. I had to find a way to take the, uh, the mess that I had uh, found myself in and uh, turn it into a message. If God can resuscitate a dead guy in a red car, he can give you a better life now and a better life in the world to come. Are you ready for that? How much lingering pain do you still have today? Quite a bit. Still in almost constant pain, Don walks with difficulty, and his left arm doesn't turn normally. But more than anything, he yearns for something more. I have had the enormous privileges and joys uh, here in life since I returned. Watched all three of my children graduate from college. I have had the privilege of walking my daughter down the aisle. But I'd rather be there. before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a gut. Did you ever see a root that was attractive? He's a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness. And when we should see him, we should not desire him. But it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. A verse that always chokes me up. It Please the Lord to bruise him. Do you fathers take delight in bruising your child? One of the curses of America today is child abuse. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? Because that's the only way he could bring total glory to his father. I heard somebody quote today, God loves you but hates your sins. Is God going to take your sins and judge them at the judgment and leave you alone? Well, some say there's no trouble for us at the judgment, but it says that man who has failed God, he shall suffer loss. Not his sins, he shall suffer loss. The last message of Jesus to the church is repent, 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 repent six times over in Revelation. And when he's going out to people, men living in defeat are going to tell heathen people how to get saved. Ask someone if they're saved from hell. Well, that's wonderful. It's a fringe benefit. Are you saved from lust? Are you saved from fear? Are you saved from doubt? Are you saved from anger? Are you saved from envy? Are you saved from pride? He came to save us now from sinning. Christianity is NOT, not a sinning religion. It's a victorious religion. He didn't come to break a few filthy, stinking habits in my life and change my cursing lips to blessing lips. He came to do more than that. God's business is to make us holy. Therefore now, not tomorrow, Obedience, trust and obey, there's no other way. You know, the old Methodist used to sing a hymn, Blessed are the men of broken heart who mourn for sin with inward smart. You know, five minutes inside of heaven we'll all be embarrassed. We wish to God we'd be more faithful. We wish to God we'd be no, more obedient. We wish to God we'd have explored the possibilities of grace, as Lowry called the resources that there are in the Godhead. My definition of a prophet is that prophets are God's emergency men for crisis hours. We don't need a prophet in America. We need a prophet in every pulpit. Are we trying to improve on God? You know, we don't have a holy God. We have a utility God. He's there to answer your prayers, send your money, send your gifts. 
I say to America what I say to you, God doesn't owe you a single thing. That this generation has sold itself without blushing to the gods of greed and sex and pride and self-will. But the church is mumbling on about the goodness of God and we're as near hell as a nation has ever been. This is linked in with revival, I don't care what you say. I've almost made a vow today I won't go to any gathering of men about revival unless they lay all night between the altar and the doorpost. We want revival our way, go to hell. If you're depending on somewhere you're going to work it, it'll never come. The Christian life will only work one way, that's God's way. Revival will only come one way, that's God's way. The reason you're a dwarf spiritually is we want to eat the word of God, you won't wait on him, you won't hear his voice, and you won't obey him. The secret of revival is obedience. There's nothing in our flesh, nothing in our theology, nothing in our doctrine, nothing in our terminology. It must be the Holy Ghost. If you have the Holy Ghost, you'll live a holy life. If you have a holy life, you'll be easy to live with. If you have a holy life, nobody on earth or in hell can offend you. The greatest miracle in the world is that God can take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make that unholy man holy, put him back in an unholy world and keep him holy. That takes all the blood of the cross and all the power of the Holy Ghost. And your will is total submission to God. You say Jesus is God. How can you say Jesus is God? So a lot of people are still puzzled by Jesus because they simply see Jesus not as a savior but as a supplement. As long as we conclude that Jesus is simply here to improve portions of our life rather than give us an entirely new life, we will fail to understand who he really is. Some ask, even believers today ask, is, is, is God really with us? Does God love me? Is God for me? The truth is, you don't have to look any further than the incarnation. It's a big theological word that means God put skin and bone on and he came to the planet. Just looking at the incarnation, you must conclude that he is passionately, deliberately, and unconditionally in love with you. Think about it! What happened is God created the heavens and the earth. He created mankind. He created all of the animals. But then we fell into sin. And all of creation and all of the animals was now subject to sin. Came up under a curse. And our relationship with God was compromised. But then he sent Jesus. The son of the living God. Who brought about a new beginning. And a new era. And a new age. Man, if you want a new beginning, you got to come to Jesus. You don't need a new marriage. You don't need a new car. It's not a new house that's going to give you a Genesis. It's Jesus Christ that will give you a new start and a new beginning. You need Jesus.
Are you ready for the coming of Jesus? The truth is this generation knows less about the coming of the Lord than any past generation. This generation is least expectant of the coming of the Lord. It is seldom preached in American pulpits. It's seldom preached anywhere on the face of the earth today that Jesus Christ is coming very soon. I've heard Christians literally mock the message of the any time return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Literally mock it. The new doctrine is that he is not coming for many thousands of years because he is giving us time to evangelize the world and bring Christ back as king and then he will come at that time. And this is what is happening now. I see this apathy. Peter said of in the last days mockers will come with their mockings falling after their own lust and saying, where is the sign of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. But the day of the Lord will come, Peter said, as a thief in the night, into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall meet, melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Let me tell you why Jesus has not come yet. Let me tell you why he's so patient. It's the same reason that he's not judged America yet, because he is merciful. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. I'm amazed at his patience with America. His long-suffering. Right now, he's not thinking of judgment. He's thinking of mercy. We're not to look upon the coming of the Lord as a day of vengeance only upon wicked sinners. That's not the focus of the Christian, according to the Scripture. The Bible warns you and me that we have enough work on our hands to take care of ourselves. What manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conduct and godliness. Beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that you might be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. You and I can sit around and we can look for the signs of the time. We look at Israel for signs of the time. We look at the moral landslide and the signs of the time. We look at headlines of the signs of the time. The Lord says, look in your own heart for the signs of the time. Be sure that you're diligent. Be sure that you are keeping the word of God. Paul said, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now you can be sure that God's going to judge the wicked. There's no question about that. The word of the Lord is true. He said the books are going to be opened and every man shall be judged out of those things written in the book. And there's a payday coming. There's certainly a payday coming. But God is saying to us, Shall not God avenge his own elect which cry night and day unto him, though he bear along with them? He said, I'll do that. I'm going to deal with that. But he said, nevertheless, when I come, will I find faith in the earth? The Lord himself says, will I find faith in the earth when I return, when I come? Here's the greatest concern the Lord has as far as I see it when he comes. He's not going to be focused on avengement. He's going to be searching for a people who are walking in faith to expect Him. Jesus is coming, the Bible said, for people who look for His appearance. He's coming for a people who are preparing. They're getting their robes spotless through trust and faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They're every day waking up saying, is this the day that the Lord comes? They're not focused on the things of the world. They're not wrapped up in the things of this world. There's a cry in their heart birthed by the Holy Spirit. If there's a cry in my heart, a hunger for the coming of the Lord, what I have in my heart about the coming of the Lord is something that I hear every time I go to prayer now. Every time I seek His face, the Lord says, wean yourself from the things of the world. Don't let the things of this world take your heart. Look up and rejoice because your redemption is drawing nigh. And the closer we get to His coming, the more He's going to awaken our spirits. The more He's going to prepare us in a wooing and drawing through the Holy Spirit. Though we don't know the very moment, the day and the hour. Jesus said of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The Lord could have given us the date. He could have told us the time and the hour. But you know what would have happened. Everybody would have lived like the devil and said, when I'm about 75, I'll repent. Not knowing that it'd be so hard by then, they couldn't repent. The Lord didn't give us time or dates so there would be a holy motivation. A holy motivation, he said, to be ready at any moment. 
to be expected. He said, I'm coming as a thief in the night. If you won't believe that I'm coming, if you don't prepare, you don't have this ever before you. I hear people say, well, I can't serve God with fear. I'll tell you, I fear missing the coming of the Lord. There's a godly fear in my heart. I don't want to be left behind. But most of all, it's a thrill and it's a joy to know and be with Him face to face. But this idea, the Lord says, you're going to start drinking with the drunken. This prosperity is going to get a hold of your heart. You're going to be so wrapped up making money. You're so wrapped up in the stock market. You're going to be so wrapped up in possessions. If your possessions are laying hold of you and you sit in the house of God like today, right in the message of the coming of the Lord, you're thinking about that car, that furniture, that house, and all the things that has got hold of you, consumes you, it pushes out any thought of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, be careful. You wind up drinking with the drunken. You'll get drunken with furniture, drunken with the things of this life, the building a bank account and all of these things, they're going to grab your heart. And then you don't want Jesus to come because you're so wrapped up, you're so busy doing these things to get security. Well, folks, in the middle of all that, the scripture says Jesus is going to come. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after. They err from the faith. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Keep thou this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me at that day, but not only to me all, only but unto all them also that love His appearing. Paul said, I've got a crown waiting for me because I love His appearing. I'm ready. Be patient now. Establish your hearts. And the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James 5, 8. None to them that look for Him shall they appear the second time without sin. God, awaken our hearts. He said, wake up. Wake up. I'm coming. Prepare. The scripture says, but we have not yet seen all things under authority. This society is broken down. We see the brokenness in the schools. We see the breakdown of state governments and everywhere we turn. We see the breakdown of law and order. The writer says, we don't see things in order. There's supposed to be divine order. And in the church of Jesus Christ, there is. But we see this fear. We see this breaking down. And then in verse 9, yeah, we, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, we see Jesus. We don't have our eyes on the brokenness. We don't have our eyes on the confusion. No, we can't keep our eyes on that. If you keep your eyes on that, brother and sister, you're going to lose the rest. God has given the promise to His church of going through any situation, any trial, no matter how difficult it is, if we would keep our eyes focused on Jesus, His being stoned. And I'm sure He's in drawing His last breaths. And I am convinced that when we have our eyes focused on Jesus in our hardest of times, there will be some kind of manifestation. There will be, the Lord will appear in the spirit he will give a word there is always something of comfort and he turns to the crowd in the very process of being stoned no he was not delivered he died but he said I see Jesus sitting on the right hand of the father because he had his eyes focused on the Lord you have an example of John on the Isle of Patmos isolated in a cold stony place and in his hardest moment, isolation, loneliness, the scriptures said Jesus appeared. And when I saw him, I felt his feet. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, for I'm the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. Behold, I live forevermore. Amen. Nothing can touch you, John. 
And I believe the secret of overcoming now is to see Jesus in everything that happens in our life. We've got to see Jesus in it. If we can't see Christ in it, we cannot overcome. Verse 4, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart in me is desolate. What he's saying in the Hebrew, I feel like my heart is ceasing to beat. Oh, Lord, verse 7, hear me speedily. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those that go down into the pit. Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those down into the pit. Lord, David said, I have to see you in this. Don't hide your face. I want to see you. Somehow, I need a manifestation. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. He's saying, Lord, tomorrow morning, I want to hear the word of your loving kindness. And I believe he's not speaking about just tomorrow. He's speaking about every tomorrow. That there has to be something of the word of God, of the loving kindness of my Father. Something from heaven that God loves me and concerned about me. I want to hear this. I want to hear it. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. Give me direction. Lord, that's what I'm asking. I'm asking, oh Lord, deliver me from my enemies. And here is his challenge to God. Lord, I flee to you to hide me. And folks, the original that says, I will veil myself in you. Now you think about it. You see, our faith now can't be based on emotion. Our faith that we're going to need now cannot be boasted on just the testimonies of others who've been delivered. It can't be just a shout. We have to have a foundation for the faith that we're going to need. And that this has to be laying hold of God's own claims of who he is. And here's what David is saying. God, here's the basis upon which I come to you. Not what I've heard in the past about people. But here's what you told me you are. You said that you are faithful, that you are just, that you are holy. You cannot lie. You said you're long-suffering. You said you're the God of peace. You said you're the God of my strength. Now, I'm coming to you. I'm going to lift my hands to you. I'm going to believe what you said about yourself. Lord God, I've lifted my hands to you. I have trusted you. I have claimed your promises. You are who you said you are. And from now on, from this day on, I'm going to fail myself in you. I'm going to cut myself off from all confidence in my flesh or in people or anyone else. I'm going to throw myself at your mercy, your grace, your power, your glory.